Wonderful. And I'll take a moment just to say hello. And I'm Danica Strecco with PLT. And I would like to acknowledge and share how grateful I am to be able to teach, work, learn, and live on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people in Vancouver, British Columbia. Hi, and I'm Janice Fold. I'm with the WNET Group in New York City. We're the creators of Cyber Chase, and I want to acknowledge and pay deep respect to the Lenape people upon whose unceded and ancestral homeland lies New York City. And I encourage all of you in the chat to do your own land acknowledgements in, in um, just in the chat so we can see where everyone else is from and see your land acknowledgements. Back to you, Ian. All right. And I will do a, a proper introduction of our, our presenters just shortly here. I uh, quickly want to let you know a bit about Green Teacher. Our, our mission is to enhance environmental literacy among young learners by equipping both practicing and aspiring environmental educators in all educational contexts with innovative, relevant, and evidence-based resources. This helps us achieve our vision of ensuring that each successive generation of young learners is more environmentally literate than the last. Now, how do we accomplish all of this? Well, you're experiencing it tonight through webinars. We also have a quarterly digital magazine that's been running for over 30 years. The next issue is coming out next week, and it is all about wild native bees. We hear a lot about honeybees, but not so much about the 4,000 wild native bees across North America. We've also produced many books over the years, the two most recent ones, Teaching Kids About Climate Change and Teaching Teens About Climate Change, which are available through us directly or at the nonprofit Outdoor Learning Store. And of course, of course, the phone is going to ring right during a webinar. Just give me one moment. After business hours and everything, but it wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without some sort of interruption like that. Continuing on, I mentioned about Green Teachers Podcast, a new episode just was released today about the role of gamification in environmental education. We've released 38 episodes and you can find that talking with green teachers wherever you get your podcasts. We always like to thank our webinar partners who spread the word about these webinars. You may well have heard from a number of these organizations across Canada and across the United States. So thank you to all of them. Many of them are affiliates of the North American Association of Environmental Education and we thank them for spreading the word. As for our presenters today, we have Dana Castreco, whom you have just met. She is based in Western Canada, Vancouver, British Columbia, as she just mentioned, and she is representing Project Learning Tree on the Canada side. Also representing Project Learning Tree is Anna Lerner, who is going to be handling the chat box. So you will see Anna posting as she already has done so. Speaking after Danica is Janice Fold. She is representing Cyber Chase. And joining her and presenting after her is Janelyn Mays, also representing Cyber Chase. Each of them will give a more detailed introduction to themselves once they begin. But I don't want to talk too much. I'm going to pass the virtual baton over to Danica. And we are going to get this party started. So Danica, take it away. Thank you so much, Ian. So. Again, my name is Danica. I'm the Senior Education Manager for Project Learning Tree. I've been working with PLT to lead and launch the execution of PLT's Forest Literacy Framework, a guide to te teaching and learning about forests. And I play a central role in expanding SFI's educational work in Canada. Now we really feel that outcomes are essential to measure and chart success. And we do our best to identify and deliver them on them in all aspects of our work. So this, session will be a success when you feel confident to do the following two things. Use PLT and Green It Up, so engaging hands-on activities and educational media to strengthen kids' mathematical and other STEM skills, as well as using the outdoors to create fun, authentic learning for kids five to eight. So those are our goals for, day, for today and the next 50 minutes together. And so then we'll take a look at the agenda up here next. Again, this is just kind of a rough idea of the flow of today's workshop. We're gonna be getting hands on with some activities and I hope that you have a pencil and paper handy. Maybe some of you got out and collected some seeds to sort along with us. 
And that's really so that we can take a close look at why use nature to teach math, including those strategies for using math, ways we can use nature for teaching and categorizing, teaching, categorizing and graphing. And I hope that you can all stay right to the end of today's session with us as we have a great list of tips for teaching outdoors. And so again, just a quick reminder that it is interactive. We hope that you can have your cameras on so we can see your faces. We're gonna be using cameras as well as slides with visuals and accompanying narration. You should see the prompt on your screen to turn on captions as well. We encourage constant conversation throughout the chat. Anna will be there for you. And there'll be an opportunity to raise the hand function at the end and ask questions on mic or in the chat at the end of the program. So hold on to them until then, um, as well as seeing your comments and sharing on the Jamboard. So I'm excited to head over to the Jamboard and take a quick look at what you've shared with us so far today. And if you are just joining us, you can still follow the link and add to it live. That's the great thing about the Jamboard is it doesn't have to be complete. So hopefully we'll see that kind of coming up for everyone in just a moment. Um, or again, if you're already on the Jamboard, I'm seeing lots of great things moving around there. And this is kind of, you know, we want to look at some of those trends. I absolutely love that um, kind of gift that someone's put on there in terms of describing math. So seeing, you know, it's great to see that some people are saying fun and easy. That's not a lot of the time how I describe um, using math fun, maybe, but easy is not something I often said about it. And so I think, you know, we do often see a lot of those connections to that hard or challenging. Maybe it is kind of boring or not as engaging for some students. And then that's kind of comparing it to those, you know, words about nature. Let's see what we have going on over here. I see relaxing, fun, lots of cool with exclamation marks, calming even. And so that's where we really want to take these two elements and merge them together to hopefully capture the attention of those students that might have some kind of hesitation or barriers to learning math and engaging with those activities. But we know that mathematics and other STEM skills are so important. So we wanna be able to get as many learners on board. So I do wanna head into some of our benefits for using nature and the environment to teach math. And you'll see kind of a snapshot slide on the screen in just a moment, but we'll definitely share these kind of full tips after today's session. So nature is innately fascinating context for learning math concepts. Math helps us to understand the natural world around us and can inspire new mathematical ideas. And so here are just 10 that we selected. Um, I definitely hope to learn from you in the chat if you have other ones up here. But a few of my favorites are really using math in a real life context, helps learners see how and why it is important in their everyday lives. It helps to move math learning from the abstract to the concrete. It also supports diversity. Sorry, we'll just stay on that slide for a couple more. Um, the outdoors offers an infinite variety of pathways and materials for learning math skills and concepts, some of which we're gonna to explore today. This diverse context is beneficial for diversity of learners with a wide range of social, emotional, physical, cognitive, and cultural needs, as well as it enhances that cross-curricular learning. By doing math activities outside or in nature, children not only develop math, skills and can meet academic standards, but can also better understand science and social studies concepts. It strengthens their language proficiency, those other STEM skills, and really kind of promotes life skills overall. It's also excellent for supporting child development. Fresh air and sunlight are important to children's health and well-being. Outdoor learning can improve learners' attention skills, elevate mood, and provide opportunities for physical development. So 
I hope you keep some of these in mind as we go through our hands-on activities today and kind of think about how you could use some of those benefits. And PLT is definitely dedicated to making those connections. And so a little bit about PLT and how we connect these benefits in our programs and resources is that Project Learning Tree advances environmental literacy, stewardship, and career pathways using trees and forests as the windows on the world. PLT is available through our network of partners across the US and internationally, including resources specific to Canadian audiences. We are an initiative of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. In 2020 alone, PLT has reached 2.3 million students and trained nearly 8,000 educators to help students learn how to think not what to think about complex environmental issues. And so we're really excited to feature some of these resources that we'll check out on the next slide here. We have a range all the way from early childhood education with our trees in me resources. We're featuring an activity from our Explore Your Environment leading into that continuum of learning with the forest literacy framework and all the way into adult and career pathways here on the next slide. We have a whole bunch of resources to start that conversation early about what is available in terms of green jobs and a variety of opportunities to connecting and exploring that early. So thank you so much for learning a little bit about PLT. I want to turn it over to Janice to introduce Green It Up. Thank you, Danica. And you know, before we go on, I'm, I know we have a lot of people in the room who are very interested in nature and the environment. And Danica and I and the rest of us presenting would love to know if you guys have any tips for using nature to help kids strengthen their math skills and STEM skills. So if you do, and if you have some lessons learned, feel free to put those in the chat because we'd love to see that and we can talk about that a little later. But I want to talk a little bit about CyberChase. And I'm curious how many CyberChase fans we have here in the virtual room. Um, <laughs> I see Jana Lynn is smiling and I see some of my uh, CyberChase colleagues here. I see Jennifer Medford from West Tennessee, my colleague Nora Jones, and my colleague um, Sharice is here joining us. So good to see um, some familiar faces here. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about Cyber Chase. Um, it's America's longest running math series. It's on PBS stations nationwide. We've been running for more than 15 years. And it features a team of curious kids who are summoned into cyberspace to outwit and outsmart Hacker, the dastardly villain. Um, and they don't have any real superpowers. Their only superpowers are their math skills and their problem solving skills. And it's really skills that any kids can use. Um, and the whole show focuses on math. And in recent years, we've really added a, a focus on environmental science and environmental learning. So let's go to the next slide. And um, in the past two years, we've launched a program called Green It Up, which is a national program, which we do in conjunction with PBS stations all around the country. And some of the stations we the, the stations we're working with this year are listed here on this slide. And basically the goal of this program is to really inspire an appreciation from nature, build STEM skills and help kids feel empowered to make a positive impact on the environment. And um, once we found out about Project Learning Tree, we realized that this was a really nice natural partnership because we specialize in how to use media to teach and Project Learning Tree really are experts on the environment. And we felt like this is a really nice kind of marriage of skill sets. So Project Learning Tree is working with our stations all around the country to help um, them think of creative ways to teach about the environment in their communities. Um, so, um, oh, and this picture here, uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you recognize this, but this is from uh, Jennifer Medford's group in West Tennessee. Um, this is, I thought this was a great picture showcasing one of the activities that her team did for Green It Up. Um, and the nice thing, the Green It Up program involves 13 different sessions, each focusing on different environmental topics. Um, we can go to the next slide, Ian. And um, these are all the different, you can see at the top here, all the different environmental topics we focus on from gardening to pollination to trees, mm -hmm. compost, food waste. And at the end of the program, kids create PSAs or posters focusing on some type of 
thing that a lesson learned or some message that they would like to impart on their community about making a positive difference in the environment. And we have free materials that are available here at this website. And um, I'll have uh, some of my colleagues will put the link in the chat so you can click on this. Um, but it's our Green It Up website and it features 13 um, hands-on activity cards, and they look like this, colorful cards. We have a Kids Can Help checklist with different kid-friendly actions, and it's printable, so you can print it out and put it on your fridge or hand it out to students. Um, we have relate each activity features a Cyber Chase video clip, um, and we have a bilingual activity, family, a family activity booklet in English and Spanish, and each of the activities in the booklet are related to the activities that are in the activity activity cards focusing on the same themes. And then we have a suite of CyberChase resources on pbslearningmedia.org, which is a free virtual, a free digital library available um, online. And if you haven't checked it out, I recommend it. It has a lot, thousands of videos and, and educational materials. So rather than just talking about what we do, I want to show you a sample of a video clip that we use in one of our lessons, one of our activities. And this is an activity focusing on pollinators. And I'll just set the scene for you. Digit, who's one of our stars, his cousin Bridget is all flustered because she has some um, a whole field of cactus apple flowers, but there are no cactus apples because there are no bats and the bats pollinate the cactus apple flowers. And she's trying to explain this to the cyber squad. And Digit is like, what do you mean pollinate? What is that about? So she's about to explain pollination to them. So Ian, here we go. See, hungry bats come to my garden to drink the nectar from my apple cactus flowers. <laughs> Is this gonna happen all day, Nezzy? Maybe, and don't call me Nezzy. <laughs> when they drink, they get pollen from the flowers on themselves. They don't mean to, but they do. That's the gold dusty stuff. Then they carry the pollen from one flower to another. That's pollination. Bats are so cool. All right, we can Monday. stop there. I'm so at this point in the show, the bats are missing, so they have to try to figure out what happened to the bats. But anyway, so we have a bunch of materials focusing on pollinators, but rather than me telling you about it, we are going to have a demonstration. So I'm gonna hand the virtual mic over to Jana Lynn, who was one of our teachers in Albuquerque, who has been running the Green It Up program with several schools in Albuquerque, and who mentioned to me that this pollinator activity is one of her kids' favorite, and she's gonna show it to us right now. So Jana Lynn, I'm gonna hand the mic over to you. Hi, yes, like she said, I am a teacher. Um, I'm gonna be starting my 30th year here in a few months. And I've taught kinder, uh, preschool to second grade. And I've even done some older grades with summer programs and after school programs. But, and I did this last summer with several schools at a summer program with a multi-age. And it really was so fun, the pollinating one. And like she said, they this is all very available, it's very, it's already printed and it gives the list of stuff that you need, background knowledge. But I was just, I'm going to show you that we, you dye some sugar. That is, there's a little prep. Um, it wasn't too hard. I used food coloring, a Ziploc and um, shook it up and made several different colored flowers. And I went ahead and had like eight different, not necessarily different colors, but different flowers so that the students weren't all at one flower because they are the pollinators. They get to pick if they're a bat or a hummingbird and they're gonna go from flower to flower looking for nectar and um, with kid-friendly tweezers and they have 60 seconds. And so they're the pollinators and they're gonna go around and <clears throat> connect, um, collect some nectar and then the magic happens after. So you set the timer. It, it's so interesting to see the, the 60 seconds. And I spread them out. And the kids- And, and the nectar are the, the pom-poms, right, Janelin? The nectar yes, the, the nectar is the pom-poms. So they're collecting these, but the pollen is the sugar. So um, their, their job, the, the pollinators, is they're gonna go around using the, the, um, the tweezers to collect the nectar. And so they have their own cup and um, that then the, once the timer goes off, they go around to the different flowers and they pick up different colors of pom-poms and they have 60 seconds to see how many different flowers they're going to go to. 
And um, it's they have a blast doing this. And when the 60 seconds is up, they go back to the carpet and that's when they, they look in their cup. And this is where I used some math. They counted how many flowers they went to, how much nectar they got, how many pom-poms. But then we went to each flower to see, did it, did it get pollinated? Because the, the beak or the, you know, whatever pollinator they are, did they carry some pollen from flower to flower to pollinate? And the yellow, I have to say the yellow is the easiest to see. Um, there were different colors and the kids were so excited because we had talked about that they, you know, that these trees and nuts and cherries and there's so many different plants need to be pollinated to be able to get our favorite fruits of cherries or whatever it is. So they were like, yes, this flower was pollinated. It will, you know, produce fruit or produce another flower. Um, orange it was also pretty easy to see some of the darker colors like the blue. Now the green and blue, it was very hard to see the difference because they weren't exactly um, as, the, the colors were a little too close together. And so they, they could see how the, they literally were engaged in pollinating and they got to pick, you know, what pollinator they were, which was very fun. And then we talked about how many flowers we went to and we added it up. What, you know, how many flowers did, you know, each student do? And that's when, I guess there's a slide, I think, with the picture of that, if we could get that. I made it, we made a graph. So now we're doing graphing. So we did some pollination and now we're gonna graph um, our stuff. Oh, here it comes, good. Here we go. So we got to talk about this graph and we had, to, we had the discussion of how we should even graph it. Are we graphing how many flowers going up or are we doing you know, a bar graph? What kind of graph are we gonna do a scattergram? And this was the graph that we ended up with. Each student has a number. So, you know, we, and then we got to talk about what, number eight, student number eight. Well, how did he get so many in 60 seconds? And he then admitted that he was grabbing more than one um, pom pom at a time, or more than one, uh, you know, a little bit of nectar at a time. But, and we said, which is the least? We used, I tried to use as many math words as we could while we were doing this. And number nine got the least. He got one. He wasn't as fast as the others he wasn't very pushy so that this activity is a perfect um, activity that gets them engaged they understand the pollination and you can use math and we also went outside then I think it was before and we looked for pollinators and we could see that you know bees and we listed all that the bees butterflies ladybugs and so we got to, so you, it leads to other, many other conversations. And then it led to an art project. So they used their cup of nectar and got to make different, uh, they made their own garden and they, but I asked them to include a pollinator. That was my favorite one, the, the little bee pollinating that flower. Um, so he understood, I could tell by, by his art that he understood that the bees were pollinating, that they were going around and um, they really did enjoy the whole, obviously the big pom-poms we added later. They, yeah, they wanted more pom-poms. So I let them use pipe cleaners, pom-poms, glue, markers, and um, just to have a good time with the art project. And then I, I asked them, well, how, what, what are these big pom-poms? And as he said, those are the pollinators flying around there. And he counted them for me. There's nine of them on this place. So, um, the, it was very easy to incorporate math and nature. But that, there's another one in all of the wonderful activities that PBS has was the food miles. And this is the one that you play a game and I believe this is a printable. I somehow have cards. I think Janice sent them to me, but you can print them. And it's a, I did it with kindergarten recently. And that was a little bit of the challenge because of the counting, but what they did it and it, and it we ended up having wonderful conversations about counting by tens. We got a hundreds chart out, right? We, you know, they showed, okay, 40, 50, and so forth. That, and so that we could count up. Then we got to use the words, well, in this game, the least amount of miles is what you want because we're trying to cut down on pollution and we want the freshest food. And it explains all this. And 
So they, but the math part then was very interesting because I'd say, well, I, they, you know, they, when it, uh, one of them says, I won, I won, I have 110. No, no, that, that's not the, which is the least number. What's the smallest number? So then we had to compare the numbers. So like I said, the, the PBS Green It Up has wonderful activities that science, but it's STEM because you use math, you can use art, you can use um, all of it while you're doing this. So if you have any questions about this, um, please put it in the chat or there will be time at the end to ask questions. Um, but I really do highly recommend this, especially in the, the, it's so engaging and they actually get to see it and they enjoy being a pollinator. <laughs> so, Thank you, Janelyn. And I just want to say, I love the way you so seamlessly and it seems like naturally integrate math and art and yeah. um, science into this activity in kind of a way that seems like fun. And I'm assuming that some of the kids don't necessarily even realize they're doing science or math while right. they're doing no, it. Right? Yeah, no. And they asked to do the pollination every day. I'm like, okay. So, but I brought it home for this and they were not happy. Uh, yeah. Cause they want to set that timer for 60 seconds and see how many flowers. And they really did once they, they could see, they loved looking at each flower to see if they got pollinated and how important that is that, it, that the bees go from flower to flower that we don't hurt them that we respect them from safe distance and so um and we got to have that conversation of why we shouldn't run and or kill a bee we get they we need them to get our food so yeah well thank you so much and on that note i'm gonna hand the mic thank you janelyn and i before thank we you. go over, I just want to, if you can just spotlight me for a second. These are what these food miles cards look yeah. like. This is an up close. Oh, you got them. Yeah. Yeah. Person with, the, with the object, like an omelet, and then oh, the amount yes. of miles, 20 miles, hot chuck. There we go. And, and now, they have, a, it's a, it is a game, but there's leading up to the game. You have a conversation. There's another video clip, of course, to kick it off. Okay, and I want to give a big shout out to Nora Jones, who's in the audience, who created these activities. So, um, oh, yay! Shout out. <laughs> and now I'm going to hand the mic over to Danica. Awesome. Thanks so much, Janice and Jana Lynn. That was fantastic. It was great to see those wonderful examples of describing, measuring, comparing attributes of objects, and connecting to where our food comes from. And so, next up, I will be introducing a PLT activity that continues to build on graphing and categorizing skills related to seeds and how they are dispersed. So to get us kind of warmed up and thinking about seeds, I'd love for you to share in the chat, what are seeds, what do they do, and what are some ways that you might categorize seeds? So if you did get out and collect some seeds, um, that's awesome to even take a look at what's in front of you now and think, what are some characteristics that maybe you see among the seeds in front of you? Or even thinking back to last time you maybe came across seeds in the kitchen pantry, or maybe they were stuck to your pant leg after a walk outside, and kind of what are some of those different ways you might characterize and categorize those seeds? I'm so excited to see some of those responses coming in the chat. And so next up, I just want to introduce where our activity comes from today. And it comes from PLT's Explore Your Environment K-8 Guide. This resource has over 50 activities with lots of tips and tricks for taking your learning outside. And it uses trees and seeds to the activity uses trees and seeds to explore categorizing and graphing natural objects. And so maybe if we'll take a quick moment uh, to just take down the PowerPoint here, I just have a little introduction to seeds while I see some of your responses in the chat. And so absolutely kind of same thoughts that you have coming in is that a seed is that small hard part of a flowering plant and often produced by, you know, being pollinated just like Jana Lynn was showing us and working with her students, which, and that seed is from which a new plant can grow. So each plant needs a certain amount of sunlight, air, water, and nutrients from the soil for its seeds to germinate and grow into a mature plant. If a seed simply drops, from the parent plant and tries to grow in its shadow, it might have to compete with the parent for those essentials. 
So most seed bearing plants have developed a way to disperse seeds away from the parent, giving the new plants a better chance to find what they need to grow. Some pretty cool parenting. And so I want to kind of, again, thinking about all those great ways to categorize, see what kind of ways we could look at seeds, um, take a look or think back to some characteristics. Plants have some spectacular ways of dispersing their seeds and can invite inquiry into those dispersal mechanisms. So do you see maybe spiky barbs coming off a seed? Is it a round, smooth shell? Maybe it even has like wings or different structures that could help it move through the air if it comes off the parent plant. And again, if you don't have seeds in front of you, absolutely no problem. Just think back to your last experience with seeds as we're just heading into summer now. Hopefully we had a, a spring season coming across those different seeds. And so now I'd love to share one of my favorite videos from the Smithsonian channel that is a great kind of highlight of some of these pretty amazing ways that seeds can be dispersed from the parent plant. Violet flower seeds are crammed into a special pod. As the pod dries out, the pressure is intense. Eventually, something's got to give. That's perfect. Thank you, Ian. So I have to say, I didn't even know that that was possible with seeds before coming across that video. And I think we can probably even share the link in the chat if you want to see more of those examples. But what I'd love to do next is kind of give you a chance to actually try categorizing. So we've actually picked out a few categories that I've already seen kind of coming up in the chat as well. And we're gonna show a few unlikely or maybe more likely seeds, depending where you're from, and do a bit of a chatterfall exercise. And so if you're new to a Zoom chatterfall, it's where you type your answer, but you don't actually hit send until I say one, two, three, go. And so it's a way of having all those answers appear all at once. And I think with a nice big group of us, that's going to be a lot of fun to see coming in. So hopefully we'll get our first image up here in just a moment. And you can see that seed. And you'll notice that there's kind of four categories in the corners of the slide of where to where you could kind of choose how that seed might be dispersed. All right, so first up we have the coconut. And so again, looking at those four different categories in the corner of the slide, type in your answer, but don't hit send. All right, hopefully you have your answer in. And one, two, three, go. Amazing. Yes, oh, I love all of these. And so- it's so cool, Danica. <laughs> Definitely, I think you, we've probably seen a coconut bounce or roll, but actually we head to the next slide. The primary form of dispersal is floats on water. That's how those seeds get nice and far from that big parent plant. Because if you had a whole bunch of coconut trees growing on top of one another, it would get crowded pretty fast. So next up, let's take a look at the dandelion. And again, you can type your answer in, but don't hit send just yet. Hold on to it. And then hopefully once you have one of those four categories in there, one, two, three, go. Let's see what you're thinking for those dandelions. Nice. Yes, absolutely. Floats on air. We can even see it happening in the image. And so next up, our final one, the bonus round. Let's see how you think the pecan moves and travels away from its parent plant. So again, holding on to that in the chat. Don't hit send just yet. Hopefully you have your answer in there. 
And one, two, three, go. Nice. So we actually have a lot of kind of a mix of that stored by animals, or if you hit next on the slide deck here, um, it's often observed bouncing or rolling that categorized or that characteristic of the tough shell really helps it move that way. But just like many of you put, really could be stored by animals because I think lots of little animals would like to run off with a pecan and keep it stored for the winter months. And so just real quick, we're going to go over a couple of other examples. So next up, we have some more plants that use floats or flies on air. Again, I'd love to see in the chat how you could distinguish between whether something floats on air or flies in the air. We have a couple of different examples on screen. And as we go to the next few, see if you can kind of see what those features might be on the seed that would make it good for that dispersal method. So definitely eats are stored by animals. We have cherry, peach, hickory nut. Next, we have sticks to animals, or again, often people and pets. So again, that burdock or wild barley. And then finally, we have our released or opened by fire. And this is one of my favorite with the lodgepole pine or jack pine, as you know, it really kind of helps promote regrowth and reproduction of some tree species. If you're in an area where fire has been managed to the point where it doesn't take place, those seeds actually don't open or get released. It waits for something. And so that's why even incorporating prescribed burning, that planned application of fire in a particular confined area can then help release those seeds. Okay, so I'll head to the next slide. And I hope that you have that pen and paper with you so that you can actually do this along with me. And I'm going to take a moment actually to switch over to sharing my screen and showing you the student page that I have set up and some of the seeds that I have collected. All right, so hopefully you can see those seeds. Let me move my mouse out of the way. And so I went out, I was walking around my neighborhood. I found some of these with the nice wings on them these that have all sorts of nice kind of catching little branches that get stuck to your pant leg and jacket as well as some of these actually came off of a seeding kale plant and so if you did head over to our website or if you have access you can actually go and create a free plt.org account and download the student page that presets up a nice bar graph template for you or don't worry, you can sketch it out too. So even if you want to take a quick pencil and paper and create a quick bar graph for yourself, this is a great tool with younger audiences where you can actually manipulate those seeds either right on the page. So you can pour them out, you can look for those different categories and characteristics and decide out of your seeds, what do you think you have? And so we have a spot on our sheet for three of those categories. And so I've kind of noticed some of those characteristics of flies in air, six to animals and eaten by animals. And you can actually go in and say like, okay, I have, you know, six of those flies in air and map that out. You can spread them, as I said, and manipulate them right on the page, count them out either as a group or individually. And then once you're done, you can create a beautiful bar graph. This is my cooking show demo um, that you can actually share and compare as a classroom, similarly to what we saw with Jenna Lynn's bar graph, um, and really kind of take a look at maybe why some of those seeds are more abundant. Or if you were looking at what just simply got duck to you? How does that affect what sort of seeds you might find? And what I love about this activity is even just in a short time period, you can get outside for collecting and looking for those seeds and seed types. You can look at that classification of seeds and seed categories, taking an interpretation of data using classification, creating your own categories, 
And you can also create, you know, the bar graph. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here. <laughs> Sorry, the mouse appears. Um, with based on those chosen categories, transitioning from primary to secondary data, and of course, then increasing mathematical literacy, making those hands on connections to math in their own environment. And so a lot of things covered right there. And so we'll just bring up the last couple of slides that I have to share with you, because I always really like to focus again on how our resources have those academic standards, those common core math competencies laid out for you with all of our activities, and that you can again see how this kind of hits those different points for those different grade levels. Objects of attributes that can be described and measured and compared, or you know, how they can you can use standard units to describe and measure those objects and shapes. And so really making that connection to natural objects and all the different ways that you can incorporate math with them. So of course, in addition to seeds, many different types of natural objects could be collected and used for this activity. And I'd love to see in the chat some that might come to mind for you. Again, it's in the spring, you might have a great time collecting seeds, but how might the seasons or the location that you're in change that? So you can even do this activity multiple times throughout the year with different natural artifacts. I always love the design thinking extension in this one too, where you can actually use different natural art materials to design your own type of seed, adding those characteristics on there and thinking about how your seed would be dispersed. And so we'll head to the next slide because I just love to share the collaboration between PLT and CyberChase Green It Up. You can see that the Explore Your Environment activity, Have Seeds Will Travel, you know, really kind of builds in these different pieces. We have a free family version that um, is available in English and Spanish on plt.org. And we can also see how PLT and Green It Up collaborate to make those STEM-focused connections between PLT activities and the Green It Up activity cards for those explore and get outside activities and moments. So now that we've kind of gone through lots of different examples, again, I would love to see in the chat kind of what you feel your experience or level of confidence teaching outdoors. Again, that was kind of one of our outcomes. So whether you came in with that experience and confidence, or maybe you're feeling a little bit confident now at the end of the session, we'll just take a look at our next slide here. It has a great QR code that you can even scan to find a coordinator in your state. Project Learning Tree has a network across the U.S. of international and internationally that provides hands-on professional development to help classroom and non-formal educators so they can confidently teach outdoors. But this network does so much more. We invite you to contact your PLC state coordinator for local resources and assistance, ideas for incorporating place-based nature into your classrooms and programs. And so please connect to a network so that you can get that professional support. And so next, we, we promised you that if you hung on to the end, um, we do want to get to your questions. So I'll just highlight a few of my favorites from this one. But we do have those tips for teaching anything outdoors, as we know how important it is to get outside with your learners. So whether it's, you know, of course, planning ahead and knowing your site before you go outside with the kids, you want to kind of do a scan, get to know your outdoor spaces. If you're doing a math activity, what kind of areas might support that? Also establishing norms and rules, you know, discussing the safety elements ahead of time with your kids is a great way that you can all agree on certain safety behaviors before you head outside. And even remind them that this is a time for learning. It's not the same as a resource, recess break or kind of outdoor free time. Proper clothing is key. I always love the kind of saying there is no bad 
weather only bad um, clothing. And so making sure that, you know, everybody's comfortable, even if you can have some hand extra kind of gloves or hats on hand, that's great. You can start small, just kind of spreading a blanket or a sheet outside so that you can do an activity that maybe you used to do in the classroom outdoors. And then build in these lessons using the environment, whether it's using flowers and leaves to show radial and bilateral symmetry or measuring the height and circumference of trees, looking for patterns and collections of seed pods or other natural objects. This action of teaching outside really inspires problem solving and encourages questions starting a journal, a field journal to take out and make notes and observations, as well as you know, making sure that not everything needs a plan. You can capitalize on the unexpected and take a look for those teachable moments when you come across something interesting. A math backpack can be a handy tool, putting in magnifying gla glasses or rulers, some extra pencils. And of course, we want you to keep doing it. Try different times of year. Don't get discouraged. Things don't have to go perfectly. And then always take time to reflect on that experience and see how you can make it even better for next time. All right, so I hope that we've kind of inspired some questions because I know I love to hear kind of what you're thinking. And so we'd like to open up. You can put a question in the chat or there is a raise hand function if you just go to where your reactions are, um, that if you want to come on mic and ask us a question. You know, you know Danica, I just wanted to share KM, um, Kay McKenzie in the chat um, in, in response to the tips you shared said, I honestly think the biggest tip is you do not, not you, you do not have to know all the answers or be able to identify everything to do nature-based learning. And I think that's really a good point. Absolutely. Anyone else have questions, comments? I love all these tips and sharing what people have done already. Yeah, that's, I was just reading. I love that measuring plants. I should have done it at the beginning of summer and then we could have seen after all the rain. I'm still going to do it. Great idea. Yeah, that was uh, Janice, another Janice. Janice Sandberg said, we measured the plant heights around the school at various locations in different times of year. Some of the same plants were found in the shade and sun. That's, yeah. I love it. So definitely, if there aren't a lot of questions, we love making it just an answer period. And if you would like to share some of your expertise, um, again, feel free to raise your hand so that we can, you know, get you on mic or to share those experiences in the chat. Even if you have some lessons learned, like things that didn't go so well, you know, we can all learn from that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's more things that I learn every day. <laughs> yeah, we've been getting some great um, suggestions here, including don't forget your head and sunscreens in the summer, your coat in the winter. If you're really cold in the winter, I also heard a good tip is to just put everything on, but don't use any, um, the outside time, don't, don't use that for writing because that can get really messy save all the, the writing when you're back inside. That's a good idea. And Angela wrote, we measured a tree and watched the different stages throughout the season and graphed the data. Angela, do you want to talk a little bit about that? That sounds great. We were with the North Carolina Arboretum and we had the um, Arboretum come once a month. We went out every Friday and the children had to um, do observations. They had to touch the tree, look on the ground, uh, go around for evidence. We'd look up. I mean, we just really did a in-depth um, look of what branches, were there injuries, were there new um, habitats living in it. And it became an obsession that when we didn't almost remember to go out on Friday, it was an immediate reminder of Miss Adams, Miss Adams, we must get out today to our tree. So it became personalized to them as well. And that um, also brought in the uh, understanding of why trees are important to not just nature or in your backyard, but why are they important to us as well? So it was like, it was a sad time at the end of the year when we had to leave our tree. <laughs> That's great. It became their tree, right? Okay. And Alexis, I see that you, it says you walked around school property and tallied conifers and deciduous. Do you want to talk about that? That sounds really like a fun activity. 
that's basically what we did is we just walked around and we just put so we did tally marks and then we just went to see then we took our tally marks and then put it into numbers and then we graphed it it was simple it's it was first grade that's great fantastic all right, with our last couple of minutes, while we still have you all here, I do just want to head to our last slide for how we can stay connected and hopefully keep hearing these great experiences from you. And so, uh, you know, really, thank you so much for joining us today. And so to close it out, we'd like to encourage you to keep kind of sending us those experiences. We love celebrating educators who are using nature to teach. And it sounds like you're really busy getting out there and doing that. So you can always check us out on social. We're on a variety of platforms that you can see there. And if you use the hashtag project learning tree and tag um, our accounts like at CyberChase, then you know we'd love to be able to see what you're doing and celebrate that and recognize that. Um, on our channels too. So we hope that you stay in touch and definitely reach out if you have any further questions. And we'll send a follow-up email at uh, by the end of this week with resources that have been shared, contact information so that you can keep in touch with each of the organizations. And again, the recording of this webinar will be up on the Green Teacher website and Green Teacher's YouTube channel. And uh, if, if you're into the whole podcast thing, Green Teacher's latest episode just went up today. Check it out. I almost feel pretentious saying this phrase, but yes, wherever you get your podcasts, it is technically true. I've got to come up with an alternative way of saying that, but anyhow, we have reached uh, essentially the top of the hour, meaning we've timed out absolutely perfectly. So I would like to thank first our all of our participants for joining us today on you know, a beautiful time of the year, a time of the year when a lot of us probably would like to be outside. And uh, I know I'm going to go outside shortly after this. Of course, we'd also like to thank Danica, Janice, Jana Lynn, and Anna for helping with presenting and in Anna's case, monitoring the chat box. Be well, everybody. Get outside. And remember, math plus nature equals fun. Thank you, Ian. And just so you guys know, we're doing this again on July 20th. So if you have friends who missed this, we're going to be doing an encore performance. Yes, thank you so much. I've learned from all of you today as well.